Welcome to the Star of Grind. So, you know, I have, um, as mentioned, I've written a little bit about sort of 2013 as a, as a really exciting and highly active year for both angel investing and VC. Um, so I'd love to hear, you know, from your perspective, sort of what's changed in the last six months um, to make this such an exciting time. Yeah, you know, I think one of the interesting things is um, just sector-wise, there's been shift in focus from, you know, a lot of interest in kind of consumer uh, startups over the last kind of 12 to 18 months towards more enterprise infrastructure and IT investing. And so that means that a lot of the tourists have left and the people who are really dedicated to solving a real problem, um, you know, who have passion about a particular idea are the ones that are still left, both on the investing side and also on the startup side. And so, you know, that's often a good predictor of success. If, if you're genuinely interested in solving a problem um, relative to, you know, following the trends. Um, so, you know, how would you define this tourist? And, you know, do you believe that entrepreneurs in general that are sort of walking into your office um, or that you're going to be meeting at the creamery, are they of a sort of higher quality and, and than you're used to seeing? I think it's not about quality. It's about passion and dedication and understanding of a problem. Um, so, you know, uh, there's a set of entrepreneurs who decide what company they want to build based on, you know, the blogs they're reading. And then there's a set of entrepreneurs who decide what company they want to build based on understanding a problem, whether it's their own problem or a problem that they've seen firsthand. And those people have just a much more nuanced and passionate desire to build a really great company. And so um, those people are the ones who are still building great companies on the consumer side. And, and I agree with you. I think 2013, 2014, um, we're going to see a lot of the next generation of great companies driven by people who, who have that true underlying vision. So what's, what's driving you know, this pickup of activity? Is it this stellar IPO market that everybody's talking about in 2013? Or is it just because entrepreneurship is so cool that we've seen this sort of flood of, of newcomers that want to start companies in Silicon Valley? I, I, actually, I, I think it's the opposite. I, don't, I think that the flood of newcomers that came and to some extent have started to leave have cleared the air for the people who, you know, have always been here, who truly believe in building great companies because they understand a problem. So I actually think it's the opposite. You know, it's like by removing the noise, the signal gets stronger, and so it's easier for great entrepreneurs to attract great talent, and for great investors to connect with those entrepreneurs to build the companies that will matter for the next 10 years. So we've been writing a little bit about this Series A crunch. I don't know if any of you guys have heard about it, um, but it's this whole notion that uh, there's just been an influx in angel investing and seed money, and this isn't necessarily leading to um, a follow-on first round of financing. Have, you know, what do you think about that? Do you think it's a myth that's been overblown in the media, or is there something to it? I think it's a symptom of exactly what we've been talking about. Um, you know, when we saw a lot of people coming to start companies in the consumer space, who didn't really have that true passion. That was muddying the waters. We had a lot of investors who, again, didn't have the true passion, didn't have the um, you know, ability to help those companies. Uh, they just you know, thought it was a hot area. And so again, it just gets harder for the great startups to find their matches, whether it be their matches with, uh, with, with a team, their matches with angel investors, or their matches with, you know, with institutional investors. And so as that noise level clears out, um, that matching gets easier. I mean, what, one of the things that I think is really important for startup success is concentration of talent, right? If you've got one great engineer, it's a lot harder to be successful than if you've got 10 great engineers. And so as the number of companies falls, the concentration of talent increases, and the, the, the probability of success actually goes up over time. So it's almost a good thing, because it means there's just more entrepreneurs in the job market, more engineers especially. There's more, there's, more, there's more talent around more passion and you know, a greater understanding of the problems. And that's what, in the long term, leads to really good companies being built. So if you're in a situation where you've raised seed, seed money, whether it's through um, an angel or it's through friends or family, um, how do you, you know, go about ensuring that you even have enough time to build a product that's going to impress a, a VC? 
You know, I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, the, 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 um, like one of the key things you need to do is to raise enough money so you do have the time to build something that's meaningful. Um, if you're overly focused on dilution, you know, and you may not raise enough capital, then you only really have one chance of getting it right. And startups are hard, and oftentimes things don't go right the first time. So having enough um, wiggle room to be able to recover from error you know, is, is one of those things. But then the second piece is um, if, you've, if you're facing a situation when you are running out of cash and you don't have that traction, you haven't got product market fit, um, there's a question as to whether or not you should continue. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a very personal question. But, uh, you know, sometimes it's okay to say, you know, we gave it a great shot, it didn't work out, and it's time to try something new. I think both of them are, are very individual decisions, and both of them have their merits. Um, but I don't think that, you know, it's necessary to, to kind of keep pushing a rock uphill if the market's telling you that it's the wrong hill. How do you know when it's the right time to, to close up shop? Because entrepreneurs are always told that they've got to keep plugging away no matter what. People know. You know when you're hot. You know, if you listen to what other people are telling you but it feels wrong, you should go with your instincts. And you know better than anybody else. If the market isn't accepting your product, if your consumers are not and your customers are not loving what you do, ultimately you know. And you should not, you know, try to live up to other people's expectations or, you know, some kind of ideal of, you know, real founders never quit or any of that. Like, in your heart, if it's not working, you're, you're, you're wasting your own time and you're wasting the, the time of your team if, if you're just trying to solve the wrong problem. You always know in your heart. Just out of curiosity, how many um, entrepreneurs do we have in the room? Can you put up your hands if you're... Wow. <laughs> um, and how many are focused more on, cons on the consumer side? How about enterprise? Well, that's, that's probably a little bit more than we expected on the enterprise side. Um, so this is, this is another thing you sort of mentioned early on in our conversation is, is you know, you're a consumer-focused investor, but you have seen um, a lot more interest in, in B2B, um, which is you know, traditionally considered the, the unsexy space. Um, so is that, is that kind of another shift? And I've, I often you know, hear from entrepreneurs telling me that sort of the two are blending together and we're learning a lot from each other. Yeah, there's definitely a move towards consumerization of IT and like a lot of the best practices from consumer services being applied to, um, you know, more B2B applications. But again, it's, a, it's sort of this idea of, you know, are you solving a problem that you know and, and really understand and, um, you know, if, if you are, whether it's on the consumer side or on the business side, you're much more likely to be successful than, you know, allowing yourself to drift with the trends. So as there's a trend towards B2B, you know, I think what we're finding is the people who have been working on, you know, enterprise software, big data, you know, um, you know consumerization of IT, you know, SaaS platforms, um, next generation data center, for the last three or four years, they're starting to get, you know, a real rising tide behind them because they were working on the things when they weren't sexy because they had the real passion and they understood the problem. In the same way, I think that as the tide drifts away from consumer, the companies that are being started today on the consumer side, will in a few years' time, when the pendulum swings back, we'll find that the tide is going to be carrying them as well. So you are an investor in Snapchat, <laughs> pretty controversial service, and we were we were talking a little bit earlier about how you know this is a company that has a ton of users, but hasn't figured out what their revenue model is going to be and how it's going to make money. Um, with the consumer startups that you're taking meetings with now. Have you found that many of them are in the similar boat where they're sort of delaying this kind of business model until they've built up a core user base? You know, I think there's really two ways to build value um, as, a, as a startup. One, one is absolutely to be business model focused and figure out how you can, um, you know, make money from every transaction and from every customer. And, you know, most e-commerce businesses take that model. And that's obviously a terrific, you know, way to do it because you have good visibility into what success looks like. Um, but there's a lot of companies that have been successful by, you know, focusing on aggregating a massive audience and then thinking about business model later. And, you know, YouTube would be in that category, Instagram would be in that category, Twitter would be in that category, Facebook would be in that category. A lot of the billion dollar type outcomes have actually
been more from that model than from something that's a bit more deterministic and business model driven. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, it can only work if you get to be at massive scale. You know, if you're one of the top 10, top 20 properties in the world, then you don't have to worry about the business model right away. Um, now, the challenge with being in the top 20 web properties in the world is that there's only 20 of them. And so you've got to knock someone else out from there. And so that's a hard thing to do. But if you've got um, you know, the right characteristics, the right user retention, the right user engagement, and the right sort of organic growth, then, um, and you believe that you have a wide enough use case that you can be a top 20 web property in the world, then it's not crazy to, um, to focus on growth at, and, and worry about business model later. And I think of it a little bit as um, like sports teams. You know, there's only so many teams in the NBA, so it doesn't actually matter how much money they make. What matters is that if you, you know, if you want to buy a sports team, they're not making any more, so you've got to pay what the market price is because it's driven by scarcity. Now, if you can get in that top 20 in the world um, as a web property or as a mobile app or as a consumer service, then you have that same scarcity dynamic going on. So when an entrepreneur walks into your office, um, do you want to see them have a clear idea of what a revenue model might look like, even if it is you know, consumer focused in very early stage? Or would you rather just take a look at a really cool product and see how it's really resonating with users? I think it, it depends on... Um, Much better. Yeah. I think it depends on, on what sort of business they're building. So. Um, if you genuinely believe that this could be a broad enough use case that it could be a top 20 web property in the world, then I'm mostly focused on growth and engagement and retention. But if it's something more like a gaming company or an e-commerce company or um, you know, premium services or subscription business, then understanding the business model is very important. So we can, can we talk a little bit about entrepreneurial screw-ups? Um, you know, what are the kind of common mistakes that entrepreneurs will make when they you know, take a meeting with you? What sort of unimpresses you? Um, you know, the, the meeting is sort of the end point. But there's a lot of steps in the middle. Um, people talk a lot about elevator pitches. Um, and I'm, you know, sometimes surprised that, uh, you know, an entrepreneur who meets you doesn't have their elevator pitch ready. So if I ask somebody at a conference like this one, so what do you do? And if their answer is, well, it's really hard to describe. I really have to, you know, I really have to give you a demo. Do you have a half an hour? Let's go, you know, let's go sit down here right now and let me show it to you. It's a difficult thing for me to do that because there's actually a lot of people here I want to meet. And, you know, for me to go take a half an hour with somebody, you know, just to understand what they do. I think people really got to focus on being able to deliver that. And people have talked about you know, ele elevator pitches for a really long time. Um, but I think they don't always actually practice one or set out to deliver one. They figure they can wing it because they know their product and, you know, and it doesn't always come out that way. And it, it really and is this process. what does a good process. one sound like? What does a good ele elevator pitch sound like? Well, you know, so the, the key to an elevator pitch is to make me want to meet you later. And so it can be anything. It could be... Um, you know, the pedigree of the team, it could be the traction of the product, it could be, um, you know, anything that's going to intrigue me and want me to learn more. Like, once you've got me on the hook, you can reel me in later on, but you don't have to explain the whole thing. So, what's the one most compelling thing? Feed that to me and let me snap on it, and then you can pull me in later. Um, and along these lines, is it, you know, do you really pay attention to the big tech blogs and are you keeping an eye out for the for the companies that are just starting to raise funding and get a little kind of a, you know attention around what they're doing or would you rather hear from an entrepreneur that's been laying low um, there are lots of ways to find companies we tend to be quite thesis driven and so you know we'll develop a point of view about you know whether there would be collaborative consumption or um, you know uh, changes in viral content, you know, and content companies and, and media companies becoming, um, you know, much more short form or um, big data being applied to financial services. These are different themes that we have interest in. And we'll go and try to meet every company in, in that category and, and figure out which ones we like the best. 
Um, in a lot of those cases, we are meeting companies that have been lying low. On the other hand, you know, um, uh, you know, sometimes you know, great companies are obviously great. They're getting a lot of press and a lot of coverage, and uh, you know, so you, you you can't ignore greatness. Great. Well, we've got about ten minutes left, so just wanted to see if anyone had any questions, um, and it could be either you know about a question for Jeremy, or I'm happy to answer anything about pitching to the media if anyone is interested. There's been a lot in the press recently about um, Europe having um, standards for data and privacy that are a step ahead of what's considered uh, in America. And that can make a big difference to the way that e-commerce is being done now in terms of them using algorithms and, and coming up with ways to uh, target users. Do you see that as being uh, something that's going to be a, a huge disruption? Because uh, it seems like there's a big difference between the two, between Europe and America in terms of their privacy laws. And if those laws are passed in, in Europe, will that impact like Facebook and, and, and Bing and Google and the rest of the... Uh... So I, I think the question was um, how uh, European privacy laws might uh, impact kind of big data and, you know, targeting. Um, and I think, you know, we're seeing that stuff play out on the advertising side, but there's a lot of other ways that big data can can come into account, which don't run into uh, any privacy problems, uh, in particular when a user is volunteering that information. Um, so, uh, so we're investors in this company called Zest Finance, for example, and um, what it does is it provides um, short-term loans for the underbanked. So a typical loan might be $600 for six months to, uh, you know, to, to fix your car or something like that. For people who don't have credit cards and don't have access to, to, um, uh, to, to other sources of finance. And one of the things that the company does is it goes out and it looks at 70,000 data points to try to um, come to an underwriting decision. It doesn't just look at your FICO score because if you're in the unbanked, you don't, your FICO score is not predictive of anything. And it'll look at things from court records to marketing databases to, um, you know, all sorts of different sources. But because you're applying for a loan, you're actually giving them permission to do that because if you don't give them permission to do that, then they can't figure out whether or not you should get a loan or not. And so that's a good example where big data doesn't run into any privacy concerns at all because the person who's making the application wants that data be looked at to get them a better chance of getting a loan. I think you see that in a lot of financial services. Insurance is another area where I suspect you're going to start to see that disruption happening as well. Um, a pretty fascinating story that, you know, along the lines of your question was what happened with Twitter in France um, when there was that hashtag, the discrimination, and um, it was, a lot of it was kind of um, xenophobia, and Twitter was in this um, extremely complicated situation and had to balance privacy um, with kind of user freedom, and um, the whole, it was just fought in the, in the French courts and ultimately, Twitter still has to make up its mind um, about whether or not it wants to make general laws that would take down um, potentially offensive um, and abusive tweets. So that's, that's something that, um, like kind of many um, problems with these big internet companies, we're still figuring out now, and there is no answer to, but I think it's going to be a huge story in the coming year. Hi. Uh, is it on? Okay. Hi, my name is Victor. I'm a co-founder of a startup called Scribble. And I had a question about the managing the fundraising process. I wanted to pick up on something that Jessica had said, which is that generally speaking, it's really good if you can sort of shorten the timeline and try to get it done quickly, as opposed to you know, having it drag on for months and months. And um, my question is that that sounds like great advice. Uh, and I'm wondering whether or not in reality and practice, if it's really easy, that easy to do. Because sometimes you go out and you meet with a lot of people and they give you advice, do this, do that. You learn things about changing the business model along the way. And you know, unless you actually have everything already going, all, you know, full steam ahead, all pistons, you're hitting all the numbers and all that, um, it may actually be challenging to just sort of say, okay, I'm going to focus on this for six weeks and get it done. And so I'm wondering if you have any advice for entrepreneurs who are thinking about starting the fundraising process and how to manage that balance between, let me just do nothing but this versus let me do this while I'm also trying to change different things about the business along the way. Yeah, so the question is, um, you know, wouldn't it be great if you could always accelerate a fundraising process and make it fast? But like, is that actually practical, and how do you do that? Um, 
you know, I would, I would raise a, an analog, which is if you want to play basketball, it's helpful to be tall, but you can't just be taller, you know. Um, but except that you, there's one instance when you can, which is you can grow. And so in exactly the same way, um, like you can't always influence how quickly a fundraising process is, is going to go. It's basically going to be driven by how compelling your story is. So um, the only thing you can do is make your story more compelling before you start. Um, but you can't just force people to make decisions faster. If they want to see traction, if they want to see executive team hires, if they want to see business development deals getting done, and that's going to take a period of time, that's on its own timeline, and you can't accelerate that any more than you're already doing. So, um, so if those things, you, you know what's going to drive value in your business. And if you think that those value creators are a ways off, then it's likely that an investor will figure that out too, and they'll wait till they see them. So maybe you can wait until you have those value drivers either under your belt or imminent, and then start your fundraising process. Regarding, you said that uh, meeting is kind of the end point. And um, you know, it's incredibly, as Jessica said, it's difficult to get funding. How do you make uh, or express, uh, uh, how do you make the VCs to commit when you get to a meeting? How do you get to that point? Because you, know, you can en endlessly have meetings with VCs, and as you said, it's, it's very difficult to get to the meeting point. And you can end up spending a lot of time. So how do you nudge them to make a decision? So the question is, how can you get a VC to make a decision? Um, it's sort of like getting a cat to, you know, obey orders. I mean, it's like it's a very difficult thing to do. Um, you, there's sort of two things that will cause a VC to accelerate their process. One is they just get wildly excited about your business, and you know, obviously, if that happens, that's terrific. The other one is because there's someone else that's about to give you a term sheet, and, and that forcing function like drives, um, you know, dr drives, drives the process to conclusion. Um, you know, VCs do not enjoy taking lots of meetings with you because what's wasting your time is wasting their time as well. Um, so that's not their objective. Um, but sometimes they like time to pass because they're looking for some of those value creators that we talked about. So it's not that they want to meet with you they want you to go do some of those things that will then make them want to invest. Okay, well, thank you very, uh, both very much for that session. Uh, there's one more question. Uh, are you okay, man? Are your hand? I'm fine. Okay. He was All saving right. a baby <laughs> and a cat. That's our story. Yes, cat. So thank you very much. From a, from uh, a burning building. Big, big round of applause.